The Long Now Foundation owns property that's home to a number of ancient bristlecone pine trees. Researchers have been able to sample these and use tree ring analysis to see how the growth rate varied from year to year as a result of changes in weather. Sometimes the effects are obvious enough that anyone can just see them by looking at a slice of the wood, but there are also special staining techniques that can make the changes more obvious. 2036 BCE was apparently marked by a large volcanic eruption that left a clear discontinuity in the sample on the left. The sample on the right shows a couple of anomalous years around 1419 BCE. You can identify them from the blue fringes in the staining. Here's a plot of tree ring data. What's being plotted here is the thickness of the rings, which gives you an idea of growing conditions year by year. A higher value suggests a better growing season. A low value suggests that the weather was bad. I've superimposed some vertical red lines showing the dates of some of the big eruptions mentioned in Neil Fergus's book. Some of the big drops are observable in years following some of the big eruptions, notably Lombok, Indonesia, which is the leftmost one, and the one in Peru. But in other cases like Laki, there's not much of a change. So this is kind of interesting in, in that you don't always see a, a strong one-to-one -one correlation between these eruptions, these volcanic events, and weather in a particular part of the world. There's a global effect, but those effects are uh, distributed just because of the complexity of atmospheric physics. Here's a similar chart. In the lower part of the chart, you're seeing two plots, a bunch of spikes drawn in black which are telling you the amount of volcanic aerosols in the atmosphere. So for example, there's a super high spike in the late 1200s. This group here is probably Tambora around 1816. This one here is probably Lockie, and so on and so forth. So then the blue line is showing how much the temperature is thought to have deviated from average. And again, the correlations aren't always perfectly one for one. We see a big drop. Uh, after Tambora, uh, down here, but there's other cases where nothing seems to happen. At the other end of the 19th century, Edvard Munch painted this famous masterpiece. The dramatic red sky in the background is open to interpretation, of course, but the painting was made not long after the eruption of Krakatoa, which depressed temperatures all over the world and created spectacular sunsets like this one for a couple of years afterwards. In the 1960s, yet another eruption in Indonesia put a plume of ejecta into the atmosphere. The Australians got a plane in the air to take samples. When it landed, they noticed a deposit on the windscreen. One of the Australian scientists licked it <laughs> and reported that it was painfully acid. <laughs> a more sophisticated analysis found <laughs> that it was sulfates, sulfuric acid, basically. In 1991, when Mount Pinatubo erupted in the Philippines, it was possible to gather a lot more scientific data beyond the now familiar uh, empirical uh, sensations of depressed global temperatures and brilliant sunsets. This is all quite well understood. When sulfur dioxide is injected into the stratosphere, it combines with available water to form sulfuric acid, which drifts around in the form of a very large number of tiny droplets. When such a droplet is struck by light from the sun, some of the light will bounce back into space. So it never reaches the troposphere, which is where weather happens, and it can't warm up the planet. Some of the light will be deflected sideways. This contributes to a general brightening of the sky that explains the beautiful sunsets, as well as some of the mysterious atmospheric phenomena described by those Byzantine and Scandinavian sources, as well as Benjamin Franklin himself. And some of the light keeps going down and continues to warm the Earth as usual. This keeps happening for a couple of years, which is how long it takes for the sulfates to wash out of the atmosphere. Then everything goes back to normal. Sulfates have remarkable leverage against global temperatures. The amount of sulfates needed to cool down the Earth by one or two degrees simply isn't that large. It's easy to imagine engineered delivery systems that would duplicate what volcanoes have done many times in the past. High altitude tanker planes, high altitude balloons, and big guns have all been mentioned. 
this kind of thing goes under the name solar geoengineering. It's a perfectly well-known concept among scientists who study these things, but it doesn't get talked about much because it's controversial. <laughs> Unfortunately, the CO2 level in the atmosphere keeps on rising regardless. This is a screen grab from just a few days ago showing that the current level is about 414 parts per million. That's up from 411 in the last year. The graph on the lower right just happens to begin around the time I was born. <clears throat> and uh, it shows that just during my lifetime, it's gone from below 320 parts per million to almost 420. And if you look at the shape of that curve, not only is it going up, which means that the problem is getting worse, but it's got a little upward curve to it, indicating that the pace at which it's getting worse is accelerating. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, this number was in the mid-200s. Today, it's the highest it has been since a few million years ago, when the world had a completely different climate. Various governments have announced plans to cut back on carbon dioxide emissions. China, for example, is saying that by 2030, their emissions will level off. In other words, if they do that, and every other country in the world does likewise, the CO2 level will, at that point, become a mere linear function of time. It'll still be going up at an impressive rate, but the rate itself won't be increasing. <laughs> the plot will no longer have that slight upward curve. It'll just be a straight ramp angling upwards. By something like 2060 or 2070, it's hoped that the world economy might reach net zero carbon emissions. This doesn't solve the problem. It'll turn this curve into a flat horizontal line. If the CO2 level in the atmosphere is, say, 500 parts per million in 2070, it'll remain at 500 until natural processes can bring it back down again, which is expected to take on the order of a million years. There are a lot of ways in which this is bad, but perhaps the most serious threat that we can expect to see materialize in coming years is that of so-called wet bulb disasters in which temperature and humidity both get so high as to make the survival of humans a physical impossibility. Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future opens with a harrowing depiction of one such event in India. That all sounds pretty bad and like the kind of thing that a well-ordered society would mount an effective response to, but we're at the end of almost two years of a global pandemic in which a significant fraction of people refuse to believe in the very existence of a disease that's killing people all around them in the hundreds of thousands. So from all of this, it's completely obvious that the human race is gonna to have to build carbon capture technologies on an incredibly massive scale. If you think of this in terms of all the coal mines that have been hollowed out of the Earth's crust, all of the petroleum deposits that have been drained, all of the forests and peat bogs that have been burned, basically we have to fill those back up again with stable carbon-containing compounds that we'll have to manufacture. We'll need to do it fast. It'll be by far the largest engineering project in the history of the world. I believe that we will do it, and that 100 years from now, this problem will have been solved. Atmospheric CO2 levels will be back to where they were before the Industrial Revolution. That's the good news. The bad news is that it's going to take decades, and during that time, we're going to begin seeing disastrous events, such as the one depicted in the Ministry for the Future. On those rare occasions when people talk about solar geoengineering at all, it's conventional to describe it as an idea that's on the extreme fringe and that deserves to be there because it seems so dangerous. Much more research is needed, is the usual conclusion. I do wonder whether it will continue to seem all that dangerous a decade or two down the road when climate disasters are leading directly to mass fatalities particularly given the fact that nature has already performed the experiment for us on several occasions, and we know that the sulfates naturally wash out of the atmosphere in a couple of years. Danger is always relative. Jumping out of a moving car is dangerous, but people will do it anyway if the car is about to go over a cliff. So in my book, Termination Shock, an individual billionaire constructs a large gun that shoots sulfur into the stratosphere, simulating what volcanoes do. This is already a fait accompli at the beginning of the story, and so what it's mostly about is how people react to it. Needless to say, not everyone is happy. 
just to give some sense of scale, the amount of sulfur that this fictional gun is capable of launching over the course of a year's continuous operation is only about 1% of what Mount Pinatubo put into the air explosively. But in his mind, it's just a pilot project, and the plan is to build more such facilities in other parts of the world. And uh, that is the setup for a kind of geopolitical uh, thriller that is, is essentially the story of those who, uh, those who are happy about this plan and those who are extremely unhappy. Thank you.